Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a blessing to be before you. Uh, I am so grateful that you have con uh, continued to join us for our Sunday school lessons. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church, located on the west side of Chicago, where our pastor is Dr. Reginald E. Backus, and I just praise God for another opportunity to share the word. Our Sunday school lesson this morning comes from the second chapter of James, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It's, it's entitled, A Community of Equals, A Community of Equals. Uh, again, on behalf of our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, the officers and members of Friendship Baptist Church, and you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I just am grateful that you have shared with us one more time for the Sunday School Hour. If you're a member of Friendship Baptist Church, I encourage you to uh, continue to support your uh, individual Sunday School classes. Uh, each class continues to meet each week, either through Zoom or conference call. You can get the login information from your instructor or call the church, and we'll get it for you. If you don't have a regular Sunday School, we'll be happy to help you find the, uh, the right fit. Uh, so just give us a call, shoot us an email, leave a message, and we'll make sure to uh, help you get into the right class. And then also, uh, let's make sure that we continue to commit to uh, Christian education across the spectrum uh, through our Salem Baptist District Association. We have Christian education classes. Uh, Dr. Backus has the Wednesday evening Bible class each Wednesday at 6 p.m. on Facebook. And there's just uh, so many different small groups. The men meet on Tuesdays. The women of faith are continuing to meet. So please uh, uh, invest in Christian education, especially while we still have free time during this pandemic. Uh, I, I ask that you pray with me as we get through this lesson, a familiar passage, and uh, we'll just see what God gives us today. We have three goals uh, in this lesson. First, we will learn the difference between treating others equal and showing partiality. Uh, second, we will affirm that all people are valued and loved by God equally. And then uh, three, we will commit to loving our neighbors and treating them how we want to be treated. And then uh, I I'll read verses uh, 8 and 9 right now, James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Amen. So the, the purpose today is just to understand and commit to the fact that we must treat each other equally, uh, regardless of social status, regardless of wealth. Uh, uh, and then also we must uh, recognize that golden rule, treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. And wouldn't the world be so much better if we could commit and faithfully practice treating others the same way we want to be treated. Uh, I, I must admit in my own life that I, I do sometimes make mistakes of treating others unfairly. Uh, and then it's when I'm treated unfairly that I'm reminded of how uncomfortable it is. And it motivates me to do better in my own life. And so that's our purpose today. And prayerfully, uh, we'll all come to the same understanding. We'll begin with prayer and then we'll jump right into the lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to share in your word. We thank you for this church. We thank you for our pastor, Dr. Backus. We thank you for another chance uh, to, to be lifted up and encouraged and strengthened in your will. Father, help us to recognize that we make mistakes, but also help us to recognize that you gave us, us another chance and time to get it right. So while we still have time, as you continue to tarry, Lord, we ask that you uh, usher us into a new understanding of your word. Help us to practice it better. Help us to live our lives according to your word. And help us to be a reflection of your love to all those in the world, especially those that are outside of your love. Thank you uh, for all that you've done in our lives. And give us this moment now that we might be uh, encouraged to do better. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our lesson is broken down into four different parts. And we'll start with the sin of favoritism, uh, verses 1 through 4. But before we get into it, let's just look at the book of James. James was written... And while the author has not necessarily been nailed down, uh, James was written for the purpose of instructing the church uh, that was spread out. Uh, I think in chapter 1 he says to the church of the diaspora. What happened was these, the, the Christian church had spread so vastly throughout the land that they were so intermingled with other communities. Now historically, uh, the, the Jewish faith, the children of Israel, and even the early church were communities of believers. And even though it was still prone to sin as we all fall short, 
uh, the communities uh, encouraged uh, Christian living because there wasn't much opposition. Now, by the time James comes around, I believe 60 AD, at least maybe later, uh, the 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 uh, Christian philosophers, Christian theologians says that there was no community in the known world that did not have a Christian, uh, there was no area in the known world that did not have a Christian community. And because of this, the Christians were spread out. The word of God was spreading so fast that Christians now found themselves in the world. And if we remember the prayers of Jesus Christ before he left the disciples, he said that he prays that we not be removed from the world, but that we be protected while in the world. And he prayed to the Father that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And so the purpose of Christianity is that we be lights in the midst of darkness. And this was coming to fruition and at the time this book was written. Now, the problem was that the worldly uh, values, worldly practices had infiltrated the church. And w since the church was now in the midst of the world, uh, they did not do a good job of sticking to their Christian values and not allowing the world to dominate their mindset. And this is exactly what we're dealing with right now, some 2,000 years later. Still today, the church, us, Christians, those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and have been charged with spreading his gospel, we have found ourselves in the midst of darkness, and we've dimmed our lights, and we've allowed worldly practices to dominate our own lives. And I'll get to it later in the lesson, I believe in the third uh, section, but the church has now been labeled as a hypocritical institution. We are not who we claim to be. We do not practice what we claim to believe in. And we have turned so many people away, run so many people off, and so many people will not even give us a chance because we don't look like what we talk about. And that's what today's lesson is. It's about treating others well and reminding ourselves of the golden rule. And Christ summarized uh, the, the, all the commandments of God in two. He said, love there should you love God and no other gods and love your neighbor as yourself. If we do those two things, we live a life that's pleasing in the sight of God. And when we fail to do those things, not only do we displease God, but we show Christianity in a bad light and we perhaps do lasting damage in the lives of others, especially in terms of their faith. So let's get into the sin of favoritism. It's found in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The text reads, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool, you have not, you have not shown partiality among yourselves, and become judges with evil thoughts. So the sin of favoritism, uh, James, he, he, he basically instructs us, instructs us on how we should live in reaction to others. And the truth is, uh, all of our life is summarized by the way we react to things. And oftentimes, it's our reactions that dictate our future. Uh, many people, men and women that are sitting in prison right now, uh, most of them lived a good life, a law-abiding life, but all it took was one poor reaction uh, to something that someone did to them that caused them to take their life on an entirely different path. Especially today in the world in which we live in, uh, I've been watching on YouTube, they got these like road rage videos. And when I watch the road rage videos, all you see is one person forget to put on their sentinel, one person hit their brakes or did not catch the light at the right time, and it just infuriates people around them. And I've seen accidents, I've seen uh, crimes committed just based on one re poor reaction. And unfortunately, sometimes those reactions have lasting consequences in our lives. And if we're honest with ourselves, I know at least me, I wish I could go back in time and react differently to
to some things that I've done. Uh, my language has not been correct. My actions have not been correct. And it's been my reactions that have got me in trouble. Now, here in the text, uh, James illustrates how we react to others based on nothing more than what we perceive and how we interpret what we perceive. Uh, he talks about how faith and works uh, must go together and cannot be separated. Now, authentic faith does not play favorites. If we have true faith, there is no favoritism. Uh, and, and the problem is not only in church, but in our individual ministries, in our small groups, we see not only do we see the evidence of favoritism, but we see the effects of favoritism. Uh, James warns about catering to those who are in power and shows how it per perpetuates discrimination and poverty. Uh, one of the things that uh, was a bit uh, staple of the outgoing administration of the 45th president was that he had a mindset that wealth has a top-down mentality, that if we gave tax breaks to the rich and the wealthy, that they would in turn have more money to invest in their companies and businesses, and that those at the bottom of the food chain, the poor, impoverished, or low-income people, would receive the benefits in a top-down model. Well, ideally, in a great economic model on paper, that works. But we've seen for countless years how the rich get richer and the poor get poor. Uh, President-elect Joe Biden uh, uses a, uh, a speaking point often that the top 0.1% of the country, the top 100 billionaires in, the, in America, made $300 billion during the COVID pandemic since April. So while the entire world is, are losing their jobs, losing their homes, not able to buy food and groceries, standing in food lines, we see the richest people in the country have made hundreds of millions of dollars. And when we see the effect, we see the rich get richer, and we see the poor literally losing what little that they have. And it's because our system, our economy, and sadly our country is built on favoritism that values the, the rich. Now the problem happens when we allow that practice, that worldly concept to infiltrate the church. When we give preferential treatment to those that give more, those that dress the best, those that look the nicest, those that have the nicest cars, those that have the best jobs. And my brothers and sisters, uh, the truth is we all have equal value in God. And our value in our ministries, specifically in our churches, should not be based on how much we give or how long we've been there or who our parents were, or what offices that we've held, our value should be equal because we're all equal in the sight of God. The illustration uh, of the two coming to church, it's used because it can't be defended. You can't defend treating someone differently simply because they don't have the same. And we, we treat people differently because of their attire. I know as an associate, a minister, uh, when I travel with Pastor Backus sometimes uh, at funerals, uh, at guest churches, if I have on a nice suit, they'll assume that I'm a preacher. They'll invite me up. They'll fit a plate for me. If I got on, like, my, my friendship polo and a pair of slacks, they'll ignore me. They'll sit me in the back. And it's two ways to look at it. One, you can say, as, as them assuming I'm a minister of the gospel, they're, they're, they're celebrating me in a way. And we can say that it makes sense. But that doesn't give me any special value. That doesn't give me any special treatment. I don't get like a VIP ticket into heaven. I don't sit first class on the way to glory. We're all equal. And we can't allow titles, positions, especially things like attire and, and what we think uh, uh, displays wealth, we can't allow those to dictate how we treat others. Christ is not a respecter of persons. I used to hear the old people say that all the time in their prayers. Never really understood what it meant until I got older, but it, it really is saying that God doesn't care about your title, that God doesn't care about your wealth. God cares about our heart and our faith. Uh, ancient Egyptian practices uh, for the uh, four or five thousand years ago what they would do is they would bury the pharaohs with all their gold, all their
the jewelry so that they would have money to take to the afterlife with them, uh, money to spend. And uh, once uh, they were able to infiltrate these tombs, the pyramids, what they found is the uh, mummified uh, bodies of the pharaohs. And next to them was all the jewelry, all the gold. And for years, for the last 300 years, there have been grave robbers just basically plundering all this wealth. Uh, one thing that it shows me is that those men and women died and they were buried with their treasure and while their souls left, the treasure stayed with it, where it was. We can't take that treasure with us. And so when we start judging ourselves and others based on how much we have, uh, based on the wealth that we've accumulated, we miss the point that life is so much larger than the short period of time that we'll spend here on earth. And I think we don't understand that or grasp that, especially the 21st century church, that our life on earth, the blessed of us will get 100, 105 years is about the most we could get. But we have all eternity to, to abide with God, to dwell in heaven with God. And so if we look at it just from a, 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 a timeline standpoint, why are we so consumed with the little bit of time that we're here on earth? And why are we not focused on our eternity? Why are we not focused on our forever? And when you start recognizing in your own life that things are insignificant and small, it don't really affect you. Uh, stopped by a friend's house uh, last night to watch the uh, Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson fight. I was a little uncomfortable. Uh, the seating wasn't ideal. Uh, I didn't like the food. <laughs> but the fight was only an hour. And rather than complain, rather than be unhappy, I made the best of the situation with the mindset that I'm eventually going home uh, with my wife where I can be comfortable and enjoy myself. And so I don't let the circumstances get under my skin so much. And in life, when we have a focus on end time, when we have a focus on our eternity, when we have a focus on glory, we don't allow circumstances of life to get under our skin so much. And when we talk about judging others and treating others fairly and allowing wealth to dictate our minds, when we focus past uh, earth and past our current living situations and to look towards glory and towards our eventual goal of heaven, we don't allow these things to kind of hurt us so bad. Now, favoritism and faith, they can't coexist. They, 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 can't, they, they can't stand side by side. As a matter of fact, favoritism is a hindrance to faith because when we allow circumstances to dictate how we treat other people, we're saying that the love of God is not our motivating factor. And whenever we allow anything to motivate us but the love of God, there's a lack of faith in our own lives. If we trust God, if we believe in God, then all that we do and all that we are should be guided by that love for him. And if it isn't, then it's a faith issue. It's not a character issue. It's not a, a right or wrong issue. It's a faith issue. Our faith is weak when we don't treat others correctly, when we treat others poorly, especially when it's based on what we perceive to be poverty or lack of wealth or lack of uh, status. So verses 1 through 4, we see the sin of favoritism. And then verses 5 through 7, we see the discrimination of God. The text reads, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So the question shows uh, how God has not only favored, but provided the poor with the opportunity to have equal standing. Uh, the one thing about God is that all are welcome and he accepts us as we are. Uh, one of the biggest misconceptions about the church is that we must get ourselves ready for church. We must get ourselves ready to be a Christian. But the truth is, uh, 
the best way to define our Christianity is by saying it's a recognition that we can't save ourselves. It's literally giving up and throwing up our hands and saying, I can't do it. I need someone to do it for me. And then we commit to a belief and a trust in God because he's done the work for us. All we have to do is accept that work in our own lives, that work of the forgiveness of sins. Now, once we accept that gift, we are saved. And we are equally saved. We're not any more saved than the next person. We're not any less saved than the next person. We have equal access to eternal life. And now what dictates our ability to be effective in the, uh, in the body of Christ, what dictates our ability to be uh, influential, lights in the midst of darkness, is our faith in God and our obedience to his word. And so our faith must dictate how we treat other people. And when it doesn't, it's a faith issue, as I said before. Uh, most, most times the poor just want an opportunity to show what they can do. Uh, I used to uh, volunteer a lot at uh, PGM, Pacific Garden Mission on uh, Canal Street right past Roosevelt, like 16th and Canal. And one thing I noticed uh, when talking to some of the, uh, uh, the the homeless that were there, those that were in need, uh, and I paused because I've been really struggling with this word homeless, uh, and I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but one of the things that would stick out uh, to me is uh, most of the time they would say, I have a skill set, I, I know how to work, I just want a chance, I just want a job but I can't get a job because I, I'm dirty. I can't get a job because of my smell. I can't get a job because of my clothes. They won't even give me a chance. And oftentimes in life, uh, the, the, the poor, the downtrodden, just want a chance to show what we can do, a chance to show that we can uh, be contributors to society. And when we judge people or treat them differently based on appearance, based on their clothes, based on their status, based on their money, what we're basically saying is we're not going to give you a chance because you don't look up to our standards. You don't smell up to our standards. And I know I've been guilty of it myself. Uh, when someone looks as if they're below uh, what's considered standards in life, I automatically assume they're up to something. I automatically assume they're no good. When a homeless person asks me for money, and they appear to be intoxicated or uh, on drugs, I, I may not give it to them because I'll assume in my mind they're just going to use it for dot, dot, dot. And so many times in life, we allow our heart to be blocked from doing its job based on what we uh, perceive in others. And God doesn't do that to us. God doesn't look at our appearance our smell, and oftentimes in life we come to God at our lowest and our worst. Most of us found God when we were sinking deep in sin, and God accepted us just as we were, or sometimes, in some cases, as we are. God still continues to accept us now, even though we continue to fall short and make mistakes and sin against his word. And so when we hold others accountable when God has given us a reprieve, we're basically holding others to a standard that one, we can't live up to ourselves, and two, that God himself doesn't hold our, us to. So James highlights that we've overlooked the poor. When we honor the rich, we're literally shaming the poor. Uh, when we give people special privileges, uh, we're, we're, we're telling them that because you've accomplished so much in life, you deserve to be treated better than others. Uh, this The past week for Thanksgiving, uh, a young lady young black woman uh, named Inglewood Barbie. Uh, she, for the last few years, she's been running this, like, shelter system, trying to assist those that are without homes in the Inglewood community. And uh, this past weekend, she gave everyone Jordans, a haircut, and a fresh uh, outfit. What she was saying is they need to have the confidence that they are equal in society. And many of the men, when they interviewed them on the radio, on the t television, he said, I feel like a new man. I feel like I have a chance. I feel like everyone else. And it was almost heartbreaking, almost brought tears to my eyes listening to their testimonies, how just a haircut and a pair of shoes and an outfit 
gave them the strength to feel as if they were equal to everyone else. And the truth is, when we treat others differently because they don't have some of the things that we consider uh, standards in life, we're basically telling them that they're not equal because of their condition and circumstances. But my brothers and sisters, the truth is that if people could see us at our lowest or at our weakest, they would look down on us very much in the same manner that we've looked down on others in our own lives. Uh, we not only judge, but we become false judges when we treat people differently. Uh, a judge gets all the information and makes a uh, decision. When we judge people based on their appearance, we don't have all the information. We're, we're, we become false judges because we're determining what a person's value is based on very small details, oftentimes untrue details. So if we love God, we must love his people. Uh, the love we have for others transfers uh, into those that they love. Uh, one of the things that I uh, cherish so much about being here at Friendship, I've been here just about uh, 15 months now, I believe, maybe a little longer. And when I got to Friendship, people treated me so well, so friendly, so welcoming, so loving. And it wasn't because of me. They didn't really know me, and I was a stranger to some, uh, definitely not known to most. Uh, it, it was the love that they had for Pastor Backus, and when they saw my uh, support of Dr. Backus, they transferred that same love onto me. And then uh, when Christy uh, became a member of the church and became a part of my family through marriage and my Christian family here at Friendship, the same love that they had for me, they transferred on to Christy. Now, uh, some of the kindest and nicest people that Christy have met in Chicago have been because of a relationship that they have with me, and they transferred that love to her. When we truly love someone, we can't help but love those that they love. And I could give you countless examples of people that have been in my life, and their entire families have embraced me, their uh, members have embraced me, the children have embraced me, their wives or husbands have embraced me. Uh, simply because of their love for that person, it, it, it caused them to spread that love to everyone in their life. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because if we truly love God, then how can we not love those that he loves? You can't say you love me and not love my wife. It, it, it just won't work like that. You, if you got an issue with my wife, you got an issue with me. You can't come into my house sit down and eat dinner with me and say, but you're not talking to my wife because that's our house. And if you love me, you've got to love her. It's, it's, it's not up for debate. It's, it's without contestation. The same thing goes for the body of Christ. If we claim to love God, how can we not love those who he loves? And the Bible makes it clear, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. He didn't say only the people we get along with. He didn't say only Baptists. He didn't say only Westsiders. He didn't say only Christians. He didn't say only black people. He said, for God so loved the world. That means all people, regardless in and out of Christ, regardless of race, creed, regardless if they're racist, if they're bigoted, God still loves them the same way he loves us. And if we commit to loving God, we can't change the way we treat others uh, based on what we interpret to be their character, their behavior, especially their wealth or value in society. We can't take advantage of the poor for our own gain. Uh, so many times in life, we see, as I said before, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And unfortunately, our country, uh, the United States of America, was built on the bats of slave labor. And we have an institutional issue with taking advantage of others uh, for our own gain. And we, black people, have been disenfranchised more than any other group in this country because of this practice. For us to recognize the effects, the lasting effects of slavery that continue to uh, perpet uh, uh, that continue to just run rampant through black communities some 400 years later, exactly 400 years later, ironically, for us to continue to see the lasting effects of slavery, we recognize how it is to be treated differently because of things that are outside of our control. So how dare we in turn continue to perpetuate this same poor practice by treating others poorly for things that are oftentimes beyond their control. 
If anyone should understand, it should be us. We've been treated poorly because of nothing but the color of our skin. And we know how unfair it is. We know how uncomfortable it is. We know how the lasting effects have changed an entire nation. And so how dare we continue to uh, perpetuate this practice on other people. Uh, God's kingdom shows mutual belonging to God, and we deny our own standing when we treat others poorly. We are who we are in, in Christ because he gave us a chance despite our, ourselves, despite our sins. And when we treat others poorly based on their lifestyle, based on their habits, based on their shortcomings, based on their status, based on their wealth, we, we, we're basically saying, that our own status is up for debate. Because if if that is what determines your status in Christ, we haven't always been our best either. And then our own status is diminished because of that mindset. So we see the sin of favoritism, verse one through four, and five through seven, we see the, I mean, one through three, and four through seven, we see the discrimination of God. But in eight through 11, we see fulfilling the royal law. The text reads, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, the royal law, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, neighborly love is unlimited and without boundaries. We're literally taught to love our neighbors. Now, the problem is we pick and choose who we consider neighbors. Neighbors are anyone we meet, literally all people. Uh, we were watching something on television the other day, and uh, maybe like Friday night, it was like a homeless man or something. And he was picked up and helped, and the guy took off his coat and gave it to him. And Christy told me that. She said, that's what the Sunday school lesson is about this week. And I just started laughing because uh, she was studying all week. But I saw her recognizing when it was put, put into practice. And the television show, it was a perfect stranger. They had no knowledge of who they were. But the man took off his coat and gave it to the stranger because he recognized that he needed it. Uh, how many times in life do we see need but ignore an opportunity to meet the need because we're pre-consumed with protecting with little that we have? Uh, I've, it's been times in my life, uh, just yesterday, there was a homeless man standing outside with his daughter. They were both cold. You could tell that life was winning. That's the best way to summarize it. He asked me for change. But because of the way he approached me aggressively, I got into defensive mode. And I kind of looked as hard as I could to let him know, don't mess with me. He immediately apologized and backtracked, and he took his daughter and like grabbed her, almost protecting her from me. And I quickly realized in my effort to defend myself, all I did was push away a homeless man or a, a, a man that was down on his luck. And I hardened his daughter's heart by showing her that a man in a suit wasn't willing to help. As I recognized the damage that I'd done, not just to his ego, but to his daughter's ability to believe in kindness, I started to fish through my cup holder for some change. And then I quickly realized that I just left the ATM. I had over $100 in my pocket. Why was I going to give this man the least amount that I could possibly give when God had blessed me and I had extra money in my pocket and I was actually on my way to Popeye's. I quickly realized that I could miss a few pieces of fried chicken. I had food at home, and so I took a $5 bill and gave it to the man, much more than I probably could afford uh, on paper, but much less than I waste every day. I'm not illustrating that to show uh, that I did a good deed. I'm illustrating it to show that I almost missed an opportunity to give. I almost missed the opportunity to share the love of God. And I almost showed that man that I didn't care. And even worse, almost showed that little girl that no one cares and no one's willing to help. Now, I don't know what their situation is. I don't know what their story is. I don't know how their story will end. 
But I do know there are so many people in life that are robbing people, that are selling their bodies, that are addicted to alcohol and drugs because someone pushed them away, because someone didn't care because someone convinced them they have no chance, they have no hope, this is your only way. And you never know what role you will play. I don't know if I changed their mindset. I don't know if I planted a seed. I don't know if I watered. But I do trust that God gives the increase. And so many times in life we see the downtrodden bury themselves in their circumstances because they believe that no one cares. And this text is teaching us that we are called to show the world that the same way God cared for us at our lowest, that we can care for the others the same way. Uh, especially people outside of Christ, those are the ones that need to experience the love of, of God, the freedom, and the inclusion that we all share in the body of Christ. Uh, I will be the first to admit uh, I'm the chief among sinners. I, I, I believe that I've done some horrible things in my past. Some things that, by the grace of God, I don't know how I'm still free. I'm not in jail. I'm not dead. Uh, and it's only by God's grace. And so I can't ever look at others as if I'm better than them. If I'm, if, if, because I've been blessed, uh, because I don't have the scars that my past should have created in my life, because I've escaped the traps of the enemy, and even the traps I've set myself, that doesn't give me the, the ability to say now that I'm past those things, now that I've grown out of some of those things, that now I'm a better person than others, especially those that are still struggling with the same things that God has freed me from in my own life. When the chains and the shackles of sin and life circumstances are broken away, <laughs> when God breaks those chains and looses those shackles in our lives, we must remember where we came from. And we must remember the past sins that we've committed and let those be the impetus, the guide that pushes us towards being a bright, shining light in the life of other people, uh, especially those outside of Christ. Uh, we, we are literally the only God, the only Bible that people might see. We're marketers. We're marketing the Christian faith. And it's nothing worse than a snake oil salesman to selling a product that either they don't believe in, that they don't use themselves, or that they are not knowledgeable about. Uh, when I go into a store, uh, yesterday I was shopping at a store for the first time. Uh, I, uh, I had to pick up a few things. Uh, my wife's birthday is coming up, and I just needed to get a couple things uh, for the house, and I wasn't really sure what I was buying. And the sales clerk was so knowledgeable, such a believer in the product, that not only did I buy what I came in for, I bought extra based on their recommendation. And the truth is, if it wasn't for that clerk, I probably would have walked out without making a purchase at all. And the same way that clerk and her knowledge and her belief and her trust in the product inf influenced my decision, it's the same thing that we're doing in the lives of other people. We are literally influencing other people's decision. And the truth is, and, I, and I'll jump into it, we're, uh, I don't want to go too long, but the truth is, the church has literally been labeled a hypocritical institution. We have been taught that the church does not practice what it preaches. And so many people, uh, children, grandchildren that have grown up in the church, have left and ran away. And it's not because the choir ain't as good as it used to be. It's not because the air condition or the heat don't work. It's because the people in the church have shown themselves in such a poor light that you have generations of believers saying, I'm better off outside than inside. I'm better off on my own than with that group. And that's a very horrible situation to be in. Well, I, I grew up in 111th and Union on the south side of Chicago, right by Roseland Hospital. Now, Roseland Hospital uh, is a much better hospital than it used to be, but it used to be considered one of the poorest uh, health care institutions in Chicago. We used to joke that if you get a paper cut and go to Roseland Hospital, you don't come out with stitches because they just always mess up. It was to the point that people would rather drive miles and miles away and find someplace else than go to Roseland Hospital. 
and the community uh, did not use it because it was ineffective. Now, the hospital, luckily, they got a new board and they recognized the gap between proper health care and the community and they bridged it and it's a really good hospital now. Uh, but for years, people said, I'd rather just be hurt than go in there. And that's what the church is right now. People are literally saying, I'd rather be hurt than go in there because we've shown God in such a poor light. And if we ever have a chance to take the church back to what it used to be, a beacon of hope in the midst of darkness, light in the midst of darkness, a place where everyone can be treated equally, a place of refuge for those that are lost, it starts by treating everyone equally, regardless of what we think about them. Now, favoritism is literally a sin. And when we break the laws, we can't pick and choose which laws we follow. Uh, one of the things that used to infuriate me is when I saw like a police officer driving on his cell phone or driving without a seatbelt or not stopping at a stop sign or stopping at a red light. And I used to always wonder how the same people that would give me a ticket that are charged to enforce the law, how could they possibly break the law? And it's the same thing in church. For those of us that are believers, we have been charged with preaching the gospel to a dying world, a living Savior, Jesus Christ, to a dying world. Now, if we don't believe in the message that we're preaching, how dare we get out there and preach it? I, I can't advocate for proper health if I'm not doing it myself. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I switched dentists about three, four months ago, and when I went into the dentist's office, my dentist literally had the best set of teeth I ever seen in my life. It was her teeth that convinced me whatever she was saying, I need to listen because I want my teeth to look like her teeth. And I've changed my entire dental hygiene, hygienic routine based on her recommendations because I believe, based on her appearance, that she knows what she's talking about. And the truth is that people are looking at us in church. And if we're preachers and deacons and Sunday school teachers and uh, mission leaders and choir members, praise team leaders, musicians, ushers, nurses, whatever our role is in the church, if we claim to be at Sunday school every week and go to Bible class every Wednesday, our life should reflect what we claim to believe. And when it, and when it does, we draw others near. They want to know what's it about the God that we serve that has us living like this. But when we don't show God in the proper light, when our life is not changed, when our habits don't change, when our language doesn't change, when our sins continue to run rampant in and around our lives, people look at us and say, what's the point? Why should I go to church when they're no different than me? We can't just be half Christians and pick which commandments we follow. God's commandments are not up for discussion. The problem is his patience and his grace empowers us to become lethargic and corrupt in our living. Uh, right now, uh, on Thursday, uh, outgoing President 45 uh, withdrew America from the Open Skies Agreement. It was a bilateral agreement with about eight nations that allowed for nuclear oversight on Russia by sending planes over neutral sites and just taking pictures to see nuclear activity. The President was required to consult with Congress for four months and get congressional approval before he pulled out the treaty. He didn't do it. He unilaterally, by himself, pulled out the treaty on Thursday, and then he, the two planes that they used, he literally ordered the military to destroy them. Not only is this illegal, but it's a hindrance to our nuclear safety and our uh, cooperation with our allies for global peace. Congress knows he did it, everyone's upset, but there's no checks and balances. They've become so scared of the president that they literally allow him to do whatever he wants, and now it's going to have lasting repercussions. Even if President-elect Biden wants to get back into the agreement, the planes will be destroyed, and it will take at least four years to rebuild the uh, two prototypes that they used to take in those uh, satellite images. These are issues that, if go on checks, will continue to grow and snowball into a place where this country is now unsafe, even in the next 40, 40 days until the inauguration. When we see it in the Oval Office, we're disgusted. 
But when we see it in our own lives, we make allowances and excuses. When we start picking and choosing which laws we follow, which commandments of God we follow, we're just as guilty as President 45. We're, we're, we're playing a game with God's laws based on our own comfortability. And the repercussions is not only damaging to our faith and our living and our ability to be useful by God, but others are watching. And others recognize what we're doing, and it looks as if we're playing by a different set of rules. And it's nothing worse than playing by a different set of rules. Uh, every week, uh, Deacon Banks comes into the office when he gets here on Sunday morning, and he does a temperature check for me and Pastor Baptist. In my mind, I'm thinking to myself, Pastor has to preach, and I have to run the cameras in the video. It doesn't really matter what our temperature is. We can't leave. And I kind of used to say something, but then I think the guidelines that we drew up and presented to the deacon says everyone gets their temperature checked. That doesn't say everyone but past the back is everyone but the sound and technician person. It's everyone. The rules are equal. And so I can't question why is he taking my temperature because if my temperature is high, I need to go home for the safety of everyone else, and I guarantee you we'll find a way to record service and make sure it gets published. I tell everyone all the time, if you don't think the world can make it without you, die. We don't sing a sad song. If we ghetto, we don't wear some T-shirts. And then we don't make it, and we don't keep on pushing on. I hate to have that such a pessimistic or a, 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 a harsh view of life, but every now and then we think that our value is so high that we don't have to play by the same rules. That's not true. If my temperature is high and past the back this temperature is high, we need to go home, and I guarantee you God will provide what we need to keep on going in the meantime. And the problem with life, the problem with church, is that so many people, people like me, people that have been in leadership, people that have value, people that contribute, people that give, feel as if the rules don't apply to us because of what we bring to the table. And my brothers and sisters, not only does it put us in a bad light, but it disenfranchises those that are watching. And so many people have been pushed away because we're playing by rules that others don't play with. Now, I, I don't want to carry too long. Let me uh, finish this last point, and we'll get out of here. We see the sin of favoritism, verses 1 through 3. 4 through uh, 7, we see the discrimination of God. 8 through 11, we see fulfilling the royal law of love. But finally, in verses 12 and 13, we see that mercy triumphs over judgment. The text reads, James chapter 2, 12 and 13, so speak, and so, so speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So act as if our judgment will be based on how we treat others. We are literally told by God that the way we judge others will be the way that we judge. And so with that mindset, love should be our only motivating factor for how we treat others. Uh, love is the motivating factor. But the consequences are always in my mind as a deterrent. Uh, I watch these uh, as I talk. Uh, I watch the uh, the road rage videos on YouTube, and every now and then, I drive too fast. And if anyone has seen me drive, you probably laughing when I said every now and then. Uh, but I drive really fast all the time. And when I watch these videos, what it does it gives me a reminder of what can happen. Uh, one time I was in a car with a friend. He said, you're driving so fast that if you hit anything, everyone dies. And I, I thought about it for a second. I thought he was being funny, but he was serious. And I immediately started to slow down because while obeying the law should be my motivating factor, it's the consequences of our actions that sometimes are the deterrent from doing what's wrong. So how do we apply that to the text? Yes, the love of God is our motivating factor. In an ideal world, all Christians use the love of God only to dictate our actions. But that's just not true. And let's be practical. We don't always act based on the love of God. And so in those moments where the love of God does not control our mind, our language, our habits, our actions, we should allow the consequences and knowing what could happen kick in as a deterrent. So, for instance, I know I should wear my seatbelt, 
And when I see a police officer next to me, I always check to make sure I have it on. Because the consequences of that $100 ticket is a deterrent from me breaking the law. Now, how does that apply to this concept? Love should be our motivating factor. But the Bible makes it clear, when we judge others harshly, God will judge us the same way. And so if you're not relying on love, recognize that the same way you treat other people will be the way God treats you. Let that be the deterrent from doing what you must do. Basically, there must be some consistency uh, between our words and our actions. They must align. We can't be hypocritical in our own living. Uh, those that show mercy will receive mercy. We will be judged the same way we judge others. Now, with communion every Sunday, and next Sunday we'll have communion Sunday, uh, what communion does, it allows us to recognize what Christ did. Uh, right before the pandemic, uh, during first Sunday in March, uh, during communion, where the deacons were passing out the bread and the, uh, and the wine, uh, we played a video from the Passion of Christ where they showed how brutally Christ was beaten. A very harsh and, it's, and brutally What's the word I'm looking for? Just brutal. It was very explicit. That's the word I'm looking for. Very explicit uh, uh, beating. But it's necessary because sometimes we forget what Christ went through. And the text behind me on some of the offering tables, it says, uh, this do in remembrance of me. We should literally keep the sacrifice of Christ in the forefront of our minds. And if, in fact, we constantly remind ourselves what Christ went through. We recognize it wasn't because we were worthy, but it's the exact opposite. We were so unworthy that that was the only way to get right. And so when we think about where Christ found us and where he brought us from, we recognize the depraved nature of our beings, how sinful we were, how dirty, rotten we were. And I don't care what you look like now, we all used to be a mess. And once we recognize how messy we were, in some cases are, we, 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 we find the space in our hearts to accept others where they are. Yes, we get impatient. Yes, we might wish others would get their lives together quicker. Yes, our 30-year-old children and our 40-year-old husbands and our 50-year-old wives and our 60-year-old grandmothers, yes, we wish that they figure it out by now. But the same patience, patience that God extends to us, the same forgiving and grace and mercy that God lends to us, we need to lend it to others. Because when we stand before God on Judgment Day, we'll stand there brand new, white as snow, washed with the blood of Christ. God won't start looking through our past and pulling out instances of sin because Jesus paid the price for it all. That same price that he paid for our sins, he paid for the world's sins. And so don't allow circumstances, sins, value, wealth, status to dictate how we treat others because the same love that God extended to us is the same love that he extends to them. Finally, we are called to love mercy. Judgment without mercy will be given to those who show no mercy. When we don't show mercy to others, God will show no mercy to us. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, as we conclude this lesson, my life ain't good enough to stand before God merciless. My today ain't good enough to stand before God merciless. It is 9.13 a.m pre-recording Sunday school lesson. And right now, my life this morning is bad enough that I need the mercy of God to make it. And if that's where I stand today personally, I must recognize in my own life that I need the mercy of God. And for me to need that mercy, how dare I withhold that same mercy to others? It's simple. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And the world and the church will be a much better place. What a wonderful lesson. Thank you, praise God, for each and every one of you for sharing with me in, uh, in this Sunday school lesson. Thank you to Dr. Backus for giving me this opportunity uh, to share with you guys. Let's continue to uh, pray for each other, pray for our pastor, uh, pray for those that are sick. Deacon Ware is doing a lot better. Let's keep him lifted up. Deacon Evans is on the uh, – uh, I said Deacon Evans earlier. I meant Deacon Banks for the thermometer. I'm sorry. 
But Deacon Evans is on the way to recovery. Johnny Smith Jr. is home. So we're just praising God uh, for his healing power in the lives of our members. Anyone else that is sick, we're praying for you that God uh, heals your body and gives you strength and recovery. Uh, let's continue to worship God in our giving. We have four ways to give here at Friendship. We are so thankful and blessed for those of you all that have given. Uh, but you can give on the cash app, uh, Friendship Chicago, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. You can give online at our website, fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can mail your check and money order to the church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Again, on behalf of our pastor, our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, the officers and members of Friendship, thank you for joining us. Uh, may God continue to bless you, and please uh, join us at 11 a.m. for our live worship service. Uh, uh, let's just miss in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to share. We thank you for the recognition that we have fallen short of your glory, but we also thank you for your grace and mercy uh, that you gave to us first in the Son of your in the person of your son Jesus, but that you would send to us daily. Father, help us to recognize that we should treat others the way we want to be treated. And for those of us that have been treated poorly in our lives, we know how uncomfortable and how unhappy it makes us feel. So help us to remember when we have been treated poorly and let that push us towards loving others, regardless of what we think about them, regardless of what we assume, to love them equally the same way you love us. Uh, bless this church. Bless all those that have uh, heard this word. Let us be strengthened and encouraged in your will that we might be better off tomorrow than we were today. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen to each and every one of you. Please have a blessed week, and I'll see you at 11 a.m. for our worship service. God bless you.